this room. Uh, okay, whatever. Here's a warm up. I'm annoyed. Um, the warm up is about the idea of validating invariance. So here is a tree. My question to you as the group, does this tree qualify as a binary tree? Yes, yes I agree. Yes. Every node has at most two children. So yes, it is a binary tree. Is this a binary search tree? No. Okay. Anyone want to raise their hand and tell me which node breaks the BST invariant? Yeah, let's see back there. The 12 to the left of the 10. So if we see down here on the bottom right, we've got a 10. Its left child is 12. That's larger than 10. And it's that is breaking the BST invariant. Love it. Exactly. This is not classified as a BST anymore. Now, this third question, balanced, is not something we have talked about yet, but is something we're going to talk about today. Balance actually does have a mathematical calculation, and it is a way to establish if the nodes of the tree are distributed fairly across it. So we sort of have been talking about how if we have a tree that degenerates into a singularly linked nest, that ends up being a really bad runtime, right? Because it's all about the height of the tree. And if it's just a linked list, that's like a super tall, long, skinny tree. I don't know if anyone else here also has been using plants to fill that dark hole in their heart over quarantine. But like, if you don't give your plants enough sun, they grow all weird and long and spindly. That's what a degenerate tree is. Instead, we want to provide the right amount of literal sunshine so they grow all big and bushy and balanced. We're going to keep the height down and the leaves numerous, right? Um, and so this question down here on the bottom, if it's it balanced, the definition for balance, and we're going to go over it a bunch today, is that no subtree's height is any more than at most one different than its sibling. So what that means is, is that if I look at six, I want to see what is the tallest subtree, like what's the height of its left child and what's the height of its right child, and they can't at any be any more than one off from each other. And that is a recursive property. I think if I click. So this tree is what we would call balanced. And if you just kind of look at it, remember I was talking about like fullness? It looks, it kind of looks balanced, but we're going to talk about the specific mathematics for that. That was just our way to sort of dust off the cobwebs. Does anyone have any uh, quick questions about BSTs before we dive into a whole new tree today? Cool. Okay. I promised you some topics for the midterm. I don't know what to call it. I feel like if I call it a midterm, everybody freaks out. And then I called it a simulated midterm and everyone didn't know what that is because we kind of just invented it. Whatever you want to call it. Here's the instructions for how it's going to shake out. So one reminder, exercise two is due tonight. Uh, reminder, project two is due next Wednesday. And for funsy, oh, I brought it up on my laptop, but I'm not on my laptop right now. I was going to show you the Poll Everywhere results. But the Poll Everywhere results looked like the vast majority of you have started uh, on Project 2. So I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you even just for reading it. Good job, y'all. If you haven't gotten a chance, I understand. Life is hard, but please start early. I will say all of the TAs, myself included, have experienced pretty light office hours this week, which leads me to believe that office hours next week will not be so light, so plan accordingly, yeah? Um, so project two is due next Wednesday, and then we are not going to release another project until the week following. So FYI, you are gonna have a full break, full week break between programming assignments. Specifically, because we're gonna ask you to do this midterm thing instead. Um, and then, uh, also, exercise three. Exercise three is a midterm practice. We literally are going to give you an example 
of a student completing the midterm and ask you to review it, which will be the second half of the midterm. So you can start to understand this format. We're also trying to work out some of the rough edges, things like that. Uh, but exercise three will be released on Friday. It will be due on the 29th. And then we will not be releasing another exercise. So from Friday of next week until Wednesday of the week following, the only assignment you will have out is the midterm because we're specifically not trying to overload you. Um, like I sort of mentioned, the midterm is going to be written with the intention that like if you were here under you know the time pressure of the weirdness of midterms, it would take you an hour to do this exam. We're going to give you from Friday through until Monday to work on it. I recognize that you know in the comfort of your own home and looking things up online, you're probably going to take longer than an hour, but that's the intention. Uh, so what we're going to do, and this will make more sense once you look at exercise three for, for reference. Exercise three isn't posted yet. It's going to get posted a little later this evening. Um, we're going to give you a scenario and ask you to explain how you would design and then implement the code to address that scenario. You're going to fill out something we're going to call the design worksheet in which you're going to be asked to pick an ADT that you think fits the scenario and then pick a data structure you can use to implement that ADT. We're then going to ask you to analyze the best case scenario and the worst case scenario of your design and then give the big O's for those two things. You will see an example of this in exercise three. In exercise three, we have a scenario and then we have two sample students designs. That's what you're going to be asked to do between that Friday and Monday. Then on Monday, we're going to release the staff designs. I hesitate to call them solutions because they're designs. Multiple designs can be correct. That's the joy of this class. <laughs> um, and then between Monday and Wednesday, we're going to ask you to look at our designs, look at your designs, and fill out what is going to be called the design review worksheet. We're going to ask you, like, hey, does that design really optimize for everything that it wanted to? If so, give us some examples. If not, how would you change the design? Um, I think maybe filling out that design worksheet and doing that will also take maybe about an hour or so of your time. Uh, and then those will all be due on Wednesday, uh, the Wednesday after the 29th. Here are the topics that will be available to you uh, for the design, meaning we're going to give you a scenario, right? And we're going to give you then a list of ADTs and a list of data structures to select from when creating your designs. So the ADTs we have covered already are list, stack, queue, and map. On Monday, we're going to learn another one called Priority Queue. They did talk about it briefly in 143, but we're going to review it. And then the list of data structures will be arrays, linked lists, like the linked nodes, hash tables, and in the hash table context, separate chaining, linear probing, keep in mind all of those pieces, but hash tables in general, uh, binary search trees, AVL trees, which is what we're going to be talking about today, and then this thing called heaps. So AVLs we're going to learn today. Heaps we're going to learn on Monday and Wednesday. That will be the end of the content we're going to cover for the exam. We will have lecture on Friday that we give out the exam. And we're going to be talking about a very cool data structure that actually kind of comes up in interviews a lot called tries. But it will not be um, a topic on the exam. Does anyone have any questions about how this is going to work? or curiosities at this point. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of curious on like the grading. Like how easy and how hard it is to like group the lines together. Ah, the question is about the grading because this is weird. We're grading designs. We're not necessarily grading code, which feels a little different, right? So I will fully admit we're working on it in that like this is a new format for us, but we have a lot of experience, quote, grading designs like this. And what we're going to be grading is how well does your design articulate and optimize for the given scenario? So you can probably come up with a design that like is able to do everything, but it might not be the quote optimal design because maybe the runtime of your design is much longer than if you had used something different. So we're going to grade for if you selected a design that is optimized based on the way you articulated, that's one piece. 
And then we're also going to be grading for what we call correctness of your own analysis. So even if your design just like isn't optimal, we're gonna ask for the best case scenario and the worst case scenario, and then the big O of those things. And even if you don't have an optimal design, if you correctly analyze and identify the best and worst case, or correctly identify the big O, you'll get points for that as well. Uh, I know this is also different, You're uh, like, and it's also a little unclear how much data, you know, like, details to give. That's why we're doing this exercise three, because we want to model for you an example of how this might go. So I'm hoping that after you take a look at exercise three, you'll kind of see some examples of how people would go about approaching this format. Yeah. We're going to do two scenarios. So you're going to have to do two separate designs. Okay. Um, if there's no other administrative questions, then... Uh, this is sort of where we left off, right? So here's our degenerate tree, our sad, dark room, no sun, spindly thing. Um, and then we've got our perfectly balanced tree where things are nice and evenly distributed. The closer we are to perfectly balanced, the better the runtime. The closer we are to degenerate, the worse the runtime. And that's all generated because each level of the tree is usually a level of recursion, which you can essentially think of as another iteration in your code. So if you only have to recurse down a couple levels, that's going to be much faster than if you ever count a lot more levels. So can we do better? Uh, so right now, the way that BSTs work is there is no way that we are going to guarantee that they will be nice and balanced, right? Like we talked about previously, if you insert every number in ascending or descending order, you're gonna get that degenerate tree. So is there something we can do where we can limit the height of our tree and maintain that good runtime? What we're gonna do is we are going to add an invariant that Salt Bay has here for us, uh, to further put limitations on the definition of a tree so that we continue to inch closer towards that optimal runtime. So we are in search of a, quote, short BST. Um, so like maybe what we do is we're just like, hey, we don't like, we, we should limit the height. Maybe we're just like, hey, once you've gotten too tall, we should do something. Or we don't like it when it's too tall. Um, but this is like really hard to implement. Um, invariants are not really about that sort of specific like goal. They're more about how we can pick a structural thing that we can then transform into a test in our code. And then inside of that test, maybe we can trigger some behavior. So unfortunately just saying like, don't let it get too tall. That's really hard to actually code anything against. Um, and the thing about it too is that we need a lot of these invariants. They usually have to apply recursively, right? Like our BST would break apart if we only cared about the top node. These things have to be true at all levels. And if we had an invariant that was based on the height, that's kind of like looking at the entire tree. So if again, we're looking for an invariant that we're gonna transform into an if statement that's gonna sit inside of our recursive method, then we probably have to think about our invariants and how they're going to apply recursively throughout the entire tree. Okay, there we go. Welcome to the AVL invariant. So an AVL tree is a tree that has the same invariants as the binary search tree, meaning it's a binary tree. It must follow the binary search property. So AVLs have the same requirement. To the left is less, to the right is more. But we've added in one extra requirement. The requirement is for every node, the height of its left and right subtrees may only differ by at most one. That's what I was talking about in the warm up here. So what this means is, is that from the overall root, we're going to check the height of its left tree and the height of its right tree. And the difference in that height can be at most one. And then we're going to do it recursively at each piece. I'm going to show you a bunch of examples of what this actually looks like in tree form. So um, 
The, it, just in case you're curious, AVL, it comes from um, some names. Uh, just like math, computer scientists like to put their names on stuff they've invented. Um, that's what AVL stands for. And honestly, I can't remember their names. None of us do. So they're all just part of AVL now. What a, what a beautiful legacy. Um, and so why does this thing really matter so much? And I know I've been harping on this. is Because remember, if we maintain that balance then we're really leveraging all of that available space and we end up with a denser structure and a shorter structure. And that then means every time we make one of those left or right turns, we're now actually guaranteed that we're eliminating half of the possibilities of traversal. Before it was like, ooh, if it's full and balanced, that's probably gonna happen. Now we're guaranteeing that's going to happen because we are guaranteeing the structure of the tree, which then means it guarantees us a worst case runtime of log n. So adding this invariant has now officially protected us from the degenerate tree situation, which means our worst case runtime of finding something in this tree is at most log n. We just have to go through one singular path in the tree, choosing left and right at each node. So, sounds great. We've done it. We've figured out how to make the tree. How does the code for this actually work? While this is delightful and theoretically very fun, I'm now going to show you, hopefully with a bunch of delightful animations, what a pain in the arse it is to actually implement this. When I took this class, this exact class, back in <laughs> a long time ago, um, this was one of our assignments where we had to program AVL trees, which is super fun because I'm actually still quite close with my lecturer from that time. And every time I get to this lecture, I text Jessica Miller. I'm like, hey, I get to tell my students, I'm not making them do the AVL tree assignment. You're going to do heaps instead. Don't worry. It's coming up, though. It'll be a good time. But I'm going to show you what I mean um, with all these uh, rotations. The other reason I tell you that they're kind of a pain in the arse to maintain is that you will probably find it would be very surprising for somebody to ask you to implement this in an interview. You will probably find it would be very surprising to ask anybody to implement this even in industry. We typically rely on the Java implementations of, say, an AVL tree to make this happen. But it is important for you to understand how this works. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more because AVLs fall into a particular category of tree. I'm going to be walking through the details of this, but you'll find that there's actually a lot of different designs for how we can build what we call a self-balancing tree. So here are our three invariants for AVL trees. They must be a binary tree, they must be a binary search tree, and they must be balanced. Let's measure some balance. So here we have a tree on the left. It's got an overall root of eight. Its left child is seven. Its right child is nine. Is it a BST? Yes. Is it balanced? Yes, I agree. Uh, eight's left subtree has a height of zero because I'm going one down and that seven node with no children, that's a height of zero. But its right tree has a height of zero too. So it's looking pretty good. Let's look at that uh, middle tree. So we've got an overall root of 10. Does this satisfy the binary search invariant? Yes, cool, great. Does it satisfy the balanced variant? No, I see a lot of shakes. Um, so we look and we see 10 left subtree has a height of negative one. There's nothing there. Its right subtree has a height of one because there is one edge from the 15 down. So this set of three nodes here has a height of one. This null pointer has a height of negative one. The difference between one and negative one is two thus breaking our height invariant. Any questions on that one? What about the third tree, the eight and the seven? Does that satisfy the binary search property? 
Does it satisfy the balance property? Yes, I also agree. It's left subtree has a height of zero and it's right subtree has a height of negative one. That's only one different. That's totally fine. What about seven? Does that satisfy the binary search property? Yeah, I agree. Nothing's out of order. Uh, does it satisfy the balanced property? Yes. I threw these in just so you would have those examples of the edge cases, but yes, there you go. That's how you would measure whether or not something's an ABL tree. I think we have more. Okay, great. More ABL trees. All right. I'm going to give you a minute. Talk to the people around you, and you can see there's our three invariants on the left. I want to know, is it a binary tree? Is it a BST? Is it balanced? Go ahead. Chat. Good. See a lot of pointing. See a lot of counting. I love it. All right, let's see. Uh, we'll start with hopefully the more evident of the invariants. Is it a binary tree? Yes. Okay. Is it a binary search tree? Okay. Is it balanced? Ooh. Is there any node in particular? Remember, these have to re apply recursively. So if you find one node that has imbalanced subtrees, that breaks everything. Is there any node that we should walk through together where we're like, we're not sure if that node is balanced? Anybody have any? We're unsure. So we're all pretty convinced that it's balanced? Okay, let's see. Yep, yep. Haha, -ha, yes, it is balanced. I personally, I think the one of this that can look a little weird is if you look at the four, it looks like it almost would be imbalanced because it doesn't have like those inner nodes. But as long as the left and right subtrees have a height, which remember is the longest path, it doesn't have to be full. It just has to be balanced. So four's left subtree, that three and that two, that's a height of one. That right subtree, that five and the six, also a height of one. If we also look at the 10, its left subtree is the 9 and the 8. That's a height of 1. Its right subtree, the 12, the 11, the 13, and the 14, that has a height of 2. So the difference between 1 and 2 is at most 1. So this all satisfies. Any? Yes, please. So if we take away the 2 or the 6, then 4s, let's say let we take away the 2. So in that case, so we take away this one, um, we would have a height of what if it was just the three left? What's the height of just a node by itself? Zero. I agree. What's the height of this situation over here? So is the difference between zero and one break the balance invariant? No. So actually, that's okay. Ah, I see. Yes. So we're applying it recursively. So when I'm asking if it's balanced, I'm saying for its left and right subtrees. To consider the 14, I would have to be looking at, say, the 10, the 12, the 13, or the 7. Those are the subtrees 14 is a part of. So, for example, if I looked at the balance of the overall 7 here, I'd see this subtree has a height of 2. This subtree with the 10 as the overall root has a height of 3. So the difference between 2 and 3 is also okay. 
Do it again! Yay! Okay, go ahead, chat. What do you think about this one? <laughs> All right, let's see. Is it a binary tree? Cool, great. Is it a binary search tree? Cool. Is it balanced? Oh, does anyone want to raise their hand and uh, give us an example of a node that is imbalanced? Which node messes this up for us? Ooh. Okay, I hear some votes for eight. Any other votes? Let's talk through it then. So I'm looking at eight. Eight has a seven, and then it's got the 12 here situation. What's the height of just this node seven? Zero. What is the height of the subtree starting at 12? Aha. So the difference between zero and two makes this imbalanced. Uh, yes. Good job. Any questions about this? Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Um, yeah, because it, it kind of feels a little funny in that, like, um, the way we calculate height is, like, the maximum path. So, yeah, that those don't break it in that context. Yes. So, for example, like, if we look at the balance at the sixth node, the height of this subtree here, boop, 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 is one, two. So, this is a height of two. The height to the right, starting at the eight, is one, two, three. So, difference of one. So, we're okay with it. Yes. Oh, look. Okay, there we go. Thanks. Thanks, Pass Casey. Animations. Cool. Okay, so now we can determine whether or not something is an ABL tree. How do we actually build this tree that maintains itself? This is a self-balancing tree, which means that when I insert things into the tree, I'm asking the AVL code to be responsible for selecting where it puts things in a way such that the tree maintains that balance. So here's what's going to happen. Let's say we have a tree that looks like this. The overall root is 1, to the right is 2. Right now, it's a binary tree. It follows the BST. It's balanced, no problem. If I add in 3, I have chosen to add it to the right of 2 which maintains the BST property, right? Like that was the only place in the tree that I could place three without breaking the binary search property. But I have just broken the balance property, right? Because the left subtree of one is negative one, and now the right subtree of one is two. So what we're going to do is we are going to do what we call rotations. We're going to insert the node into the tree to maintain the binary search property, and then we're going to shift around the nodes so that we rebalance the tree as we go. And you can see this is exactly how it happens. We do it at the moment that we hit an imbalance. And so if we continue to do that, we might have these little shifts, these little rotations at the moment we insert a node. But if we do it every time we just click out of balance, we're never going to let ourselves get too imbalanced. 
So it's not like we're going to like insert everything into this long degenerate tree and then go back and try and rotate it. It's like at the moment of insertion, every time we check, hey, are we still balanced? If not, we better fix it right away. The AVL rebalance itself. It's a self-balancing tree. Yay. Okay. So um, this also used to be a thing that I would do on midterms where I would make you draw out all of the balances, but people have since convinced me that that's also not helpful. But I am going to make you look at these animations for the next 20 minutes. Um, so here we have an AVL tree. The one has a height of two to the sub to the right and zero to, or I guess technically negative one, right, to the left. Uh, there we go. We're going to essentially, you can think of it as like, we're going to grab that middle thing and it's almost like we're pulling it up. And then we sort of end up with, there you go, that sort of nice organized balance there. This is what we technically call a left rotation because it's kind of like we took that middle node and like pulled it to the left. So this is the technical term for this. We call these rotations. There are left rotations and there are right rotations. And what we just did is if we had a right subtree that was the longer, that was causing the imbalance, then if we just rotate like one click to the left, it's going to undo and rebalance to the left. So if we were too long on the right, we shift to the left. As you can imagine, too long on the left, shift it one to the right. Now, let's look at how this actually works in terms of code. Let's say we have a tree that looks like this, where everything was fine. And then let's say we maybe added something down here, you know, that like built this off. So what we're going to do is we're going to take B and we're going to make B's left child it was previously like this sort of like blue triangle with the two in it. We're going to make B's new left child be A, which makes sense because if B was to the right of A initially, that means B is larger than A, right? If B originally got put here, it's larger than A. So I know then if B can be A's right child, then A can be B's left child. That's the rotation piece right there. It's following that BST property. Now, again, following the BST property, anything that was to the left of B is smaller than B, which means it must be larger than A. So we can swap whatever B's left child was previously. We've replaced it with A to make this happen. But again, maintaining the binary search property, we're letting like, oh, shoot, where do we put that stuff? Well, A's right child was previously B. And so now A can hold that subtree again and maintain that binary search property. So really, we technically just swapped A's right child for B's left child. And then we swapped B's left pointer for A. So this pointer up here that's pointing at A, it kind of moves to point at B. B's left child points at A. A's right child points at B's left. I know, it's a mind twister. <laughs> Any questions at this moment? Yes. So does the order matter? And I will say the order does always matter when we're doing these sort of reassignments like this because Java will just let your nodes drift away, right? And so if you say like made temp pointers to hold everything, then it technically wouldn't matter order-wise as long as it ended up in this final state. But that's kind of redundant. You usually don't make a bunch of temp pointers. And so usually what you end up doing is you make one temp pointer. It's usually called current. Remember current? <laughs> or sometimes in tree, it's called root. You place that on the thing you're going to change first. And you should get in the habit of doing this, where it's like, OK, if I'm ready to change some pointers, make one temp pointer. Point it to something. Whatever now has two arrows pointing to it, change the old one. Then you should have two arrows pointing to something, 
change the old one. Two arrows pointing to something, change the old one. And that's usually the way I think about how I order these types of reassignments. I also will say in interviews, and frankly, even if you come to my office hours, I'm obsessed with pictures, if you can imagine. I literally usually do this where I will draw the changes of the arrows and then I order them because the order does matter so you don't drop the nodes. And I, you would be amazed at how much easier your brain can program, like if you just make sure that you number the arrows when you're drawing the changing. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I'm commingling numbers and letters here. Um, I mostly am just using ABC to sort of stand in as a representative values that are comparable to each other. And so at least I'm hoping that we're sort of okay with the idea that like A comes before B, thus is less than B. C comes after B, thus greater than B. Um, but you're right. It probably wouldn't have this commingling of letters and numbers. I'm just... Sorry, um, so I think, and this, you're right, this is absolutely unclear on these slides. These little triangles here are actually not, like I numbered them so you could tell the difference without relying on color, but these are not actually numbers that are trying to get sorted amongst the letters. They're just uh, identifying numbers to indicate these triangles. So you can see like, oh, this triangle that was here, here's that two over here. It's the blue triangle. I'm not actually putting the number two into this tree. No, thank you, that is confusing on these slides. Here's a right rotation. So let's say instead um, that something happened where we put in values such that in this context, A is greater than B, B is greater than C, right am I doing, sorry, less than, I'm going that direction. B is less than A, C is less than B, right? Again, we kind of pick up B, and again, we just do the swappings between B and A. So you can see if B was originally to the left of A, then what we can do is we can sort of shift B up. We keep its original left child, and we change its right child to then point at A. And you can kind of see, right, like these two that are between each other when you're right there, if A is pointing to you to the left and you're pointing to the right, see how that three then ends up being to the left of A, because it was originally to the left of A, right? If you kind of draw this line here, this three triangle, I don't know what's stored in it, it's just called the three triangle in this context. Um, if it's here, that means whatever's stored there, we know is less than A, because it originally got placed here. So then it's okay for it to be A's left child. B, we move that up, since we know it's less than A, it's okay for A to be its right child. So we're just swapping those pointers there. Any questions? It gets more complicated. <laughs> so let's say we have values one and three, and then I add in the value two. It looks a lot like that other time, right? That nice line situation. And so maybe our instinct is like, oh, we do that rotation, right? But we can't actually do a rotation because we can't just like rotate and make three the middle value. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't actually solve the problem. This situation here, if you can see, it's because we have a height differential that's not all along the same pathway. So that all of that stuff that we were doing, we were like, we know A is less than, you know, B, we can change all those things because we have a height that's dictated by going one direction and then the other. This is the technical term. It's called a kink. <laughs> uh, make you jokes. And the thing is, is that we can't do a single rotation here. It's not going to solve the problem. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to do what we call a double rotation. Yay! Because if a single one wasn't confusing enough, we're going to do double. And so what we do with the double rotation is we're actually going to rotate the subtree down here to get back to that original. We call this the line case. So this is the kink case. We rotate once down in the subtree to get us back to the line case. And then we can do that left rotation that we're hopefully more comfortable with. Yes. Um, what is the 
If two is smaller than one, could it ever get placed where it currently is? But you're right. I like where your brain's going. Exactly. And so that's why you'll find that actually in doing this, we sort of made this intentional design choice that we were going to always initially place to maintain the BST invariant and then rotate to maintain the balance. Because it is actually a lot easier to just maintain the structure of the tree if you never break the BST property. Trying to fix a broken BST property is a pain. It's not going to happen. Um, so, yep, there we go. Slides, slides. Here is the example for how it happens with the double rotation. So what would literally happen is, again, you sort of rotate down here first. So you can see what happened is, is originally C's right child was this, you know, like lighter colored triangle. If it's to the right of C and C is to the left of B, then we know that it can eventually become the left of B. So that triangle moved over to be B's left child. And that freed up C's right child to become B. And then we also have to change C's left child. If C is greater than A, we know that whoop, we can also just sort of like make this triangle A's right child, and then we can point C at A. Yes. Go for it. Yeah, so what we're doing is, um, and I know this all feels very new, everything I've shown you, that's technically all of the cases fall into those two things. And so actually, because we're going to rebalance at the moment that it becomes imbalanced, we actually are ever only really interacting with like three sort of like overall nodes at that moment. Sometimes we do like recurse up and that like, you know, that height thing, sort of like that rebalancing sort of cascades up. But you'll find that at least in doing the pointer reassignment, we only ever have to deal with these like three sort of nodes, whether we do the line case or the kink case, and then maybe we recurse and we have to deal with three nodes again. But that'll make it easier. And to answer your first question, the reason we knew C could become the overall root is if you can kind of see, right, the overall root, that's always going to be kind of like ideally the middle value. Remember we kind of talked about that in a perfectly balanced tree? And if we look at the original structure, C is to the left of B, but to the right of A. So it's like literally kind of right down the middle. And so that's why it can become the overall root in this context. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think in, in this case here. So it's saying that, yeah, it looks like in this case, we have officially indicated that C is apparently smaller than this triangle. Um, and so this is just us trying to show you not actual values, but representative uh, positions. And yeah. What can we do as like control the between those values to be at like an array of fundamental values like we do in tree? Ah, why don't we just take all the values and dump them into an array and maybe sort the array and then like build it intelligently based off the array? That will cause us to duplicate the memory. And that means we have to touch all the nodes every time. And so I'll leave you with this final piece. Uh, OK, just kidding. Maybe we'll do more examples. Is that the runtime to rebalance actually ends up being constant time because we're just changing those three nodes. So we never actually en incur an N runtime in order to do the rebalancing. So it's, we're going to do this test and this work inside the insert method. So at the moment that you insert, we're doing it.